Thank you very much. Okay, um, so gentlemen, now from here we move to, uh, to our uh, next presentation, uh, which is basically the fourth presentation of the conference. In order to achieve excellence and get things right, the race is to adopt best practices in all walks of life. This aspect of best practice somehow keeps coming in every conference and everywhere. Uh, however, I'm not very sure if all of us, if all of us have got best practices, uh, understanding of best practices, exactly with respect to our own respective functions and businesses. Best practice bring about standardization and embarking on a tried, tested, and proven way of conducting business and operations. What are the fast changing consumer need, be it to B2B or B2C, best practices are constantly and ever evolving. I would like to invite Mr. Ivan Renaud, uh, Regional Distribution Center Manager of Borough PTE at NAC. Mr. Ivan Renaud has over three decades of insightful experience in international logistics, warehousing, and distribution, along with supply chain operations across South Africa and NEA. He has been the Regional Warehouse Manager for Polyofin Warehousing and Distribution, for sea shipments to any ISC and East Africa and land distribution for NEA. Renaud will talk about understanding global best practices in warehouse transformation. Over to you, Renaud. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Ari, for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be having a look at best practices in order to figure out the best way to work this triple machine. Here. Okay. In his book, Reflections on Happiness and, and uh, Positivity, His Excellency <coughs> Sheikh Mahmoud al bin Rashid al Maktoum stipulated we do not want an airport for Dubai, we want Dubai to be an airport for the world. So, what exactly was he saying here? He was saying, we do not want to benchmark the biased airports against the airports of the world. We want the airports of the world to benchmark against the bias. In his book, My Vision Challenges the Race for Excellence, he said, we have seen that quality services are more profitable than normal services, provided we master the art of managing those resources and obtaining maximum efficiency from cost. So what is he referring to here? This was actually in, in reference to Emirates Airlines. <coughs> He's saying we need to apply best practices. So I'd like to talk on these two issues today. If you told your house there's no problems, then you're ability to see them is the problem. I'll be looking at driving rouse innovation into the heart of the business for improvement. That'll be benchmarking. I'll be looking at preparing for shift in capability and performance as best practice for warehouse operations and transforming operations which are best practices for supply chain. There is no single benchmark process that has been universally adopted. <coughs> Oxford Dictionary defines it as something which can be measured and used as a standard that other things can be compared with because benchmarking often people are not exactly sure what is meant by benchmark. The business directory goes into a lot more elaboration referring to products and programs and strategies of the business and they also outline the fact that objectives of benchmarking are obviously to determine the current status quo, uh, <coughs> to determine what and where the improvements are called for, to analyze how uh, the organization achieve their performance levels and then uh, obviously use the information to improve it. Benchmarking and brief history comes out of the transition from bows and arrows to rifles. And in a rifle, the rifling made the shooting of it very, very accurate. With the bow and arrow, the shot of the bow and arrow, you can see where the arrow went, the trajectory and where it stood. So you were able to determine that, but with the rifle, it just left a mark. And to determine the accuracy of those weapons, they would then hold them onto a bench and then fire a number of rounds into a certain spot, and that was called the bench mark. And that's where the term benchmarking comes out of. So when you're benchmarking, you're actually finding 
the most accurate and the best performance mark of the item that you are benchmarking. So types of benchmarking. There's a plethora. You've got process benchmarking, performance benchmarking, benchmarking in the public sector, in the energy sector. From an investor's perspective, best in class, everybody loves the best in class benchmarking. You're looking at financial benchmarking, strategic benchmarking, operational benchmarking, functional benchmarking, product benchmarking. There's a plethora, plethora of benchmarking to choose from. So when you're wanting to do benchmarking, you need to know what you're looking at. Um, in terms of benchmarking, there's been a book written on it, with a 12-step process. So we're not going to look at a 12-step <coughs> process because not everybody has the time for that. Benchmarking simply identifies the problem <coughs> and the areas that you're wanting to look at. You can't benchmark everything all the time, so be focused on specific. Identify other industries, that have similar processes to what you have. Then identify organizations within the industry that are leaders in these areas, and that you can do through looking at the, the results that if they're a listed company, you can consult with customers, what is the talk of the business, and so forth, and from there you can then de determine what companies you want to focus on. Survey the companies for their practices, and once you've surveyed them for your practices <coughs> and your process measurements, you can you can visit them, contact the company and say to them, we understand that you're the best in the business on this particular practice, we would like to have a look at it, we would like to share information on practices with you. And then bring the information home and implement it. Sounds simple, but it's a process that requires a bit of intense work. What you need to be, be, be careful of and be aware of <coughs> when you're looking at best practices, you need to be specific and define what you wish to benchmark. Be sure of what your end goal is. If you're not sure what you're wanting to achieve, you're not going to be sure how to get about achieving it. I'm sure that you can't pair apples with apples because misaligned benchmarking is going to lead you into a pack of trouble. And this is quite important because quite often people do incorrect comparisons and then they can't understand why they can't get the results. Don't over-elaborate the process. Keep it simple. KISS. Keep it short and sweet, but keep it short and simple. That's a mantra you can use in anything. <coughs> Ensure that the benchmark that you settle on is appropriate for your business, for your business operation, and be careful who dictates what your benchmark is. What do they know about it? Benchmarking often in an organization will be driven by the finance department. Finances work in terms of what is the cost and the bottom line, and they <coughs> use these measurements within their own operations. So they will say to you, we need a benchmark. Are you <coughs> operating the best level that you can? And as a consequence, they will want to often direct and drive how you should benchmark and what results you should be looking for. You need to actually have a look at your own benchmarking processes and de determine how you're going to do it. Benchmarking does not have to be against external sources. You can use internal standards, and I'll elaborate on that. Use financial measures. Financial measures and budgets, they're a benchmark. That's your target. You're not allowed to use more than that. You must use that. That's a benchmark. That's a determination of what you can do. If you can exceed it by improving on it, all that much better. Evaluate the KPIs in your business and in your operation. For value add. <coughs> if they add that no value, then there's nothing to benchmark, eliminate it. Who do you think set the benchmark for these companies? Do you think that they said, we want to have a look at, at the company next door and see if we can do it as well as they can? Do you think that they took their practices and built it on these companies? Or do you believe that these companies took their practices? <coughs> international standards and said we will take it further than where this is. If you look at these, all top of the range, and they are top of the range in different areas. Lamborghini, Ferrari, and Rolls Royce, Ford, <coughs> Toyota, they're all top of the range in a sector. They don't benchmark against everybody else. So be accurate in terms of how you're going to look at what you're doing so that you can actually compare apples with apples. I like internal benchmarking. 
I prefer to do internal benchmarking. I've done it for years in my operations because it gives you a measurement against yourself. What defines your internal benchmarking is the best that you've achieved. Year on year statistics. How can you use it? Last year's highest, last year's lowest, last year's best is your benchmark for this year's operation. Value added measurements. If it's worth doing, it's worth measuring. Conversely, if it's not worth measuring, it's probably not worth doing eliminate the process or eliminate the function or eliminate the measurement. Benchmarking is only the foundation. Benchmarking will not work if you don't introduce and apply best practices. Because <coughs> continuous improvement should be dictating your benchmarking process. Because continuous improvement is the link between benchmarking and best practices. So you need to focus on that. You can decide on whether you want to be following the, the, the industry standards or the best in the industry, compare yourself to them, or you can decide whether you actually want to be the industry leader. And I refer to the earlier slide, those companies all decided they want to be the industry standard. Perhaps they started aiming at the best in, in, the best in their area, and once they got to that point, they exceeded them. So how do we put these best benchmarking into place? You need to look at putting in best practices. So um, to a large extent preaching to the converted every day in terms of, of warehouse and supply chain best practices, but let's go through them. Physical operation, minimize your touches, eliminate superfluous steps, superfluous backwards and forwards, multiple moves, uh, that type of thing. Take them out. Look at the stock layout in your warehouse. Make sure you've got fast moving items close to the shipping floor. Heavy items close to the ground for economic purposes and also if you're going close to the shipping floor. Practice first in, first out. Look at your warehouse layer <coughs> in terms of the process. If you have long run lines of racking, put in a thorough field down the center of the racking so that I can go after at lane A, cut through and into lane D and finish the other one. I don't have to go to the end of the row all the way down and back in. So have a look at that slide, an operation in Johannesburg which had that cut out of a lot of extra walking. <coughs> so minimize the, 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 time, the, the operating time between locations. Also look at your warehouse traffic plan. Make sure that your traffic flow is in a set direction. Don't have pickers walking against each other. Don't have forklifts operating down roads where pickers are, walk, are, are walking. Your cleaners that are cleaning up during the picking process, make sure that they follow the picking <coughs> process and don't work against it so that you can avoid congestion uh, and you can avoid uh, people just wasting time trying to get around it. Keep down your picking ways. If you have a large warehouse, <coughs> you can cut out things like all the sequence picking. So you cut out your picker starting in lane A and working it right through A, B, C, D, all the way down to lane X, A, E. Give him a section to pick and, and assign your warehouse section so when you release your, your picking ways it covers certain areas of the warehouse and you've got pickers focusing on that. That way you can have an order for your customer being picked simultaneously throughout your warehouse and condensed at the shipping floor and loaded in half the time or less than it would have if you had one person or two people picking down the sequence line. So way of picking is something that can really speed up your operations and put it into place. Label visibility. This is important. We take it uh, for granted. That people need to see what they're looking at. They need to see what they're picking. If they're coming at the scanning machine, they need to be able to scan and, and, and reach it. You've seen these little barcodes like this on product coming into your warehouse, and the forklift operator now has to hang out of his forklift like a monkey to try and reach and scan it. Get a big barcode. Put in a big barcode so that it can be read, visibility, so that the picker can see it. Makes your processes easier, reduces your process time, and it reduces your error rate. And assign <coughs> storage location. A lot of people talk about dynamic warehousing, is a very, very efficient in certain environments. My warehouse, we have dynamic warehousing because we have one type of product in a set padded size. So we can bring it, store it anywhere, pick it from anywhere. But if you have a warehouse where you've got principles in it, there are a variety of different goods, assign storage. It will improve your picking flow because know where the stock is, 
the number of the processes are, it eliminates waste, eliminates damage, increases your time. Technology. Barcoding, RFID, tagging, handheld scanning. People are saying, put this in as a best practice. We're actually at the stage now where this should be standard practice. But if you don't have it, consider it and put it into place. But also look at new technologies. We've got technologies, for instance, with Honeywell outside there. I'm not, I'm not advertising for them. But they've got mobile computer processes, mobile systems that you can take your warehouse office onto the floor. So have a look at putting in systems which can improve your processes. If you don't have a warehouse management system in place, get it into place. Because this will synergize your warehouse operations. It can integrate with your, your uh, inter-source uh, replenishment program, your ERP system, or your IMS systems, and keep your flow, keep your processes and your operations neat and clean. Install automatic storage and uh, retrieval systems. If you can, if you have a warehouse where you can put that in, it's going to save a lot of space. It will allow you to increase your inventory, inventory range. You can reduce your inventory and um, help your systems a, a heck of a lot. It uh, maximizes your storage space, and etc. So that's a good system if you have the type of warehouse that you can put it into, explore it. And then integrate your systems. Uh, as was mentioned earlier with our, our speakers, to integrate your systems. There are a plethora of very, very good uh, syst uh, technology systems which specialize in integrating different kinds of our warehouse process. Go and have a look, explore. We've got some of them standing outside here with, with the, in, the, um, in the stores. Go and speak to them and see what, uh, what they can offer you. Integration of your warehouse processes with technology is very important, but you need to make sure that the integration of your technologies is compatible. If you put something in that's not compatible, you've got a built-in header. So RFID inventory solutions, you're looking at something that you can operate at a distance so that people don't have to go right to the face of something. Make sure that it can reach. You can also have a look at near field communications. This is the new technology that's coming in in terms of, uh, you go to the, the uh, supermarket, do your purchases, you take your credit card and you wave it across the scanner and all your money disappears out of your account. Or your wife does it. My wife does it. <coughs> or if you advance, you put it linked into your mobile phone, scan your mobile phone. That is uh, near field communication. It's communication, technological communication that takes place at 20 to 30 centimeters. And if you have an operation where you are picking small piece, each big items, you could think you do something like that. Have a look at this, this is an option. It's mostly used in the retail and service industry at the moment, but I believe this technology will be coming into warehousing operations in due course if it isn't already been introduced. Maintain your productivity. Your, your workforce needs access to critical data and cost. So as I mentioned earlier, have a look at mobile systems, mobile tablets, uh, linking up your mobile phones, mobile computers, so that you can take your office onto the warehouse floor. Save time, save effort, save energy. Technology acronyms is a fascination of mine. <coughs> I've worked in a variety of different industries, public transport, newspaper distribution, perishable goods, construction industry, petrochemicals, and you actually pick up um, acronyms which are exactly the same but mean completely different things across the technologies, across the, the different businesses. So learn your acronyms in your industry that you operate in so that you don't find yourself wondering what the heck's going on. But it's fascinating, everything becomes an acronym and sometimes you look at it and think, what the heck is that? I've never heard of it. Next year we'll have a whole new list of acronyms. Inventory management, best practices, cycle counting. If you don't have cycle counting in the system, introduce it. It's very good, keeps your balances on hand correct. It's good for shop, uh, quality assurance between physical and systems-based inventory. It's flexible, it causes minimal disruption to operations. It can, it can be ongoing during your operations. And it allows for you to check anything. You can look at product, you can look at batch, you can look at big posts, you can look at anything that you want 
And you can run multiple cyclical counts at the same time to have a look at different aspects of accuracy within your operation. If there's discrepancies identified, don't just correct them. Investigate what the problem was and correct the process that created that. Train your staff. If you don't train your staff, they're going to make errors. Stands to reason. And don't be afraid to take action against staff who have already been trained. Sometimes they go and make the same error for the 13th time. You should have only made that error three times. Ten times earlier, you should have been moved out of that position or moved out of the organization. Warehouse hygiene. <coughs> this is a pet peeve of mine because I've worked in the foods industry and I've worked in the petrochemicals industry and it's a very, very high focus. Remove damaged inventory immediately from your picking operational areas so that it disrupts the ability to fit. Um, keep the inventory clean. You don't like to go into a shop and pick up dirty items. Nor does the receiving people in the back end of warehouses and stores like to receive dirty containers, dirty pallets of stock. Keep your warehouse stock clean so that when you ship it out, it's a good customer service. <coughs> Keep your storage bin locations in your warehouse clean because that reduces the impact of vermin, cockroaches, fish moths, uh, mice and rats because they're very, very quickly moving with the surprise how fast they are. Take away anything that could give them purchase. And keep your picking hours and lanes clean during the operation. It reduces the propensity for pilfage and it also reduces the propensity for injury. Someone tripping over an empty box. In terms of your processes, implement cross docking. As fast, efficient, speeds up your operation, eliminates excess inventory in your warehouse. Um, <coughs> delivery of goods can be done straight through from your, your, your supplier right through to the customer. It reduces your water cycle time. There's a, a plethora of benefits to cross-docking. My very first presentation done about 20 years ago was on cross-docking, so that's one of my passions. Standardize where you can in your warehouse. Standardize your storage bins, standardize your, your containers, <coughs> standardize your pallet sizes, Standardize wherever you can because it gives your warehouse an interference. It's easier to manage your, your products coming in and going out. It reduces your material handling requirement. You don't need two different or three different types of forklift or pallet jack to be able to move stock. And it also reduces your repairs and maintenance costs because you don't have such a plethora of keep sorted out. Health and safety. Leave from the front. You are the leader of health and safety in your organization. So you must be the first person to apply and the first person to set the example. If you don't set the example or apply the processes, you can't expect anybody to bother following what you say because you're not actually leading, leading that charge. Develop a safety culture. There's a lot of ways you can do that. <coughs> Empower your safety officers to stop any unsafe act until it's been rectified. Um, have an HSE moment at the beginning of every uh, picking operation briefing or to toolbox talks. Uh, have a zero tolerance policy for safety violations. Uh, we have zero tolerance uh, policy and it, it, it works. It has an impact. You commit an act, you're going to pay for it because you can't afford to have somebody injured. If you count the downtime or an LTI, it's a huge impact which could have been avoided. Those are avoidable costs. Establish KPIs for everybody. If you haven't got an HSE KPI for every person in your organization, put an HSE KPI because it makes them aware of the fact that health and safety and safety processes and procedures are very important. Establish a safety committee, not with the management, but with the people on the floor because they're the guys who are working with safety and they're the guys you want to build the culture with. So if they operate it, manage it, and introduce it, people work. If it's a top-down issue, it was just another meeting and then back to work. Put lots of posters up. Talk to your people in pictures. It's the best form of communication to cross all cultural barriers and all language barriers. Put your pictures up wherever you can in the warehouse. Provide regular training. Regular training, everybody should be trained at minimum once a month at least once a week, on some health and safety aspect within the organization. 
run static and paint on PPE. You can need to summon up. Run the static campaign on uh, heat stress. How to manage heat stress, how to combat it, um, and so forth. I run a, what I call an outbound driver safety campaign. We have contract drivers who come to our facility and pick up our products and then they distribute them all over the GCC. So we run a, 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 a campaign with them and I run it for the whole year. And in this campaign, we go through truck safety, we go through on site safety. Then we have a look at heat stress, we look at personal hygiene, all of these issues because these all impact the driver and those people are representing your company. So if you have some guy who spent five, six, seven days on the road and you can smell him from a kilometer away, that's your company's image walking through the door. So teach these guys personal hygiene so that they can improve their own lifestyle and also represent your company in an efficient way. Okay, so let's have a look at supply chain best practices. What can we do to improve, improve this? Elon Musk, even he thinks supply chain is tricky and they know what he's trying to do. Integrate upstream. Integrate vendor compliance. So putting clear specific labeling requirements that you're wanting in your warehouse, start it at your customer or at your manufacturer. Standard cassette sizes, case sizes, standard package sizes, um, uniform, uniform sizes of whatever you are processing, uniform amounts <coughs> in cases and so forth. So that your standardized packaging leans into your operation. Establish advanced shipping notification. <coughs> Don't allow the guy to rock up when it suits him. You must tell him when you need to come in and make the delivery. This will allow you to plan your cross-floor your cross operation. Um, it's very important that you put these processes in place. Delivery window. Schedule a delivery window. I don't know who you deliver. Who delivers into uh, retail supermarkets such as Carrefour or, or Spinney's or something? Anybody who's delivering into the back door? We are an operation where you're delivering to back door supermarket chains. You've got a 30 minute delivery window. If you miss it, you've got to wait until the end of the day. If you your delivery window at 9 o'clock in the morning and you missed it, your driver has missed it, he waits until 5 o'clock. And if they can take you in, they will. Otherwise, they cancel the order. So, put in these delivery windows because it allows you to manage multiple deliveries simultaneously. It allows you to plan your deliveries coming in efficiently so that you can say, okay, this is a big bulk item, it's a fast mover, get all of these across the floor now, uh, as soon as we can, bring in these heavy items so that they don't cause congestion, this is a, a urgent shipment, bring that in, and you can plan the shipments and build that in with your advanced shipping notification so that your backdoor operations are very efficiently <coughs> consumed. <coughs> Take advantage of automatic data collection technologies to support these systems that you're putting into place and to help you run the processes. And then integrate downstream to whoever you're delivering to, the next warehouse, uh, your customer, the distribution uh, center, the store, whatever it is, have clear-cut service level agreements in terms of delivery standards, delivery strategy, documentation processes, agree on set delivery, window times, backdoor procedures, um, your inbound and your return stock issues. So that if you have this agreement, let me go back a step. If you have a good agreement with your manufacturer in terms of your case quantity size, your label size, your pallet size, your uh, quantity per case, you can have that agreement run right through to the customer so that the customer knows that they can order X amount and you know that you're going to get that amount. So when your picking operation doesn't have to do break bulk, you don't have to now break the pallet down, you don't have to open up a box to get five batteries to send to a guy. They understand the set process and you can then also do the set agreements with your downstream, downstream customers. So well, you can't order five batteries, you must order a box of ten batteries. And they will do that and you will get that process in place. That makes the operation right from the manufacturer from the, or from the, the, the provider right through to the customer. 
This is a cross clicking operation. I took that photograph from my, back, my window in my office. The truck at the back is bringing raw materials in from one of the GCC countries for our production operation. We don't process this product through my warehouse because we do outbound shipments, not inbound. <coughs> However, we run a cross docking operation of our products because it benefits our operation and there was a big carbon footprint impact because we stopped trucks running from the Saudi border into Abu Dhabi to put it onto another truck so it could come back into the waste and then get through the security because we operate into the, the um, sister security area. So you have to have a special pass. So we put an operation into place where we cross dock so the plethora of benefits for everybody. But I don't want this product in my warehouse. So. This is a, a fortunate day where we were able to take it off the truck and put it onto the, our own truck. By the time the delivery driver was getting his documentation, that truck was already on its way to make the delivery. My room stock is not allowed to spend more than 12 hours in the warehouse. If it comes in, it must be moved out as fast as possible. That's in terms of my operation. So cross docking, if you put that into operation, you put those agreements in both with your downstream and your upstream people, you can really benefit your operation. You can use it excellently for big bulk deliveries. You can also use it excellently for small, less than truckload deliveries that uh, are always difficult to handle. Try and get those agreements in place to expedite your operational process and to increase your customer service and it will benefit your suppliers as well. Omnichannel expertise, which has been spoken about, I'm not going to belabor this point. There's a lot of benefit in terms of uh, looking at Omnichannel, <coughs> where you can in your warehouse, and you, you, you can try and introduce it. There's a well, multitude of benefits that come out of it. Reduced inventory in the supply chain, greater variety of products, visibility, available, uh, expanded uh, shipping options, and so forth. Have a look at it, putting in Omnichannel warehouse where you can. In terms of uh, just <coughs> summarizing where we are, in benchmarking, external benchmarking, identify the countries you wish to benchmark, be specific, compare apples with apples, don't over elaborate. Internal benchmarking, use internal standards, year on year measurements, use your financial measurements and your budget as, as benchmarks. And continuity, if you're going to put in benchmark, then you have to put in continuous improvement so that you can do best practices. You can have the world's best benchmarking in your business, but your warehouse can look like that in the warehouse, in the picture, because you actually haven't put in best practice processes. Improve physical operations, minimize touches, invest and introduce in technology, improve inventory management, recycle counts, etc. Synergize your processes, improve your HSE, lead from the front, Supply chain, integrate upstream and downstream, put in advanced shipping notices, link that in with delivery windows, <coughs> look at interfacing on the channel operations in your warehouse, put in cross docking. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you, man. Any questions, please? I think it was pretty loud and clear. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the time. Um, can we just ask these questions?